Hey guys, hello and welcome to Spud Life with me, your host, Tay Tim. Okay, so without further ado, let's crack on with this week's episode. Okay, hello, and here we go for another week's episode of Spud Life with me, your host, Tatty Tim. Here we are in the caravan of love this week, and we've got the one and only Mr. P, Mr. Chris Pearson. Hello. Hey, Chris. How are you doing? Not so bad, mate. How are you doing? All right, how are you? Thanks for coming, man. Yeah, so, no problem. Tattooing? Yeah. When, why, how uh, did it start? 1989 was the year I started. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and it, I wouldn't say I wanted to be a tattooist. I never wanted to be a tattooist. Right. I just kind of fell, kind of into, fell it. into it. Yeah, well, at the time I was knocking about with uh, Mike that owned Mike's tattoos. Yeah. And I was painting the back room out for him. So was, was, he, was he one of the, to interrupt you, was he one of the first tattooists in Carlisle? No, there was a lot before that. Was there? Aye. The, he was, I'd say he was the one, he made it clean. There was a guy before him. Yeah. Uh, and he was basically uh, doing bad things from his shop and ended in jail right, through right, it. Yeah. So Mike kind of cleaned up the name of tattooing. Yeah. Uh, but back then, tattooing was a different game. Wasn't it? It was totally different. Yeah. You know, you walked in and picked some off the wall. <laughs> but I was pent the back room out and he come through one Sunday and just said, do you want to go? And yeah. I was like, I got what? And he said, go tattooing. I said, oh, yeah, I'll have a go. I well, at the time, I was helping him out on a weekend in the shop. Yeah. And I was doing designs for him, drawing stuff up when he needed something. Because you've always been different. artistic. Yeah, guessing, yeah. Uh, but yeah. then I used to just do biro. A lot of folk are doing it now. They're doing these biro sketches, which are really fine detail. Yeah, yeah. Well, I worked for Coca-Cola at the time, so it was a low wage. Yeah. So I couldn't afford all this art stuff. So yeah. I just used to use the biros from work. And I learned, just literally a bick. Yeah, and I learned how to shade with them so I could do really high detail yeah. tone pictures with yeah, these. Yeah. Everyone's doing it now, they're a big thing on yeah. TikTok, but nobody but they were did talking it 40 years ago almost. Yeah, hi, yeah, hi, easy. And uh, so he says, Do you want to go on? I said, I'll have a go. So back then, when you were tattooing, whoever was teaching you to do the lines, yeah. And, you'd get a lined thing and you'd just colour it and shade it, yeah. mostly colour. But he stuck us down with a liner and a shader and said, do that. So right. I did the full thing. A person? Yeah, right. I did the full thing on him. And it was, he just looked in the mirror afterwards and says, I, I, I knew you'd be a natural at it. And within a month, I jacked my job. And, and I was on a full-time apprenticeship. I mean, that must have been quite nerve-wracking because you're putting something on you, someone's skin that's there forever. You've you? kind of got to... Back then, especially now, it's a big professional trade. It wasn't then; it was full of pirates. Yeah, then. yeah, yeah. You know, and I, they always. I said to a mate of mine in Italy once, we were pirates back in the nineties, yeah. and he went, "Yeah, yeah. we were." Yeah. You haven't to care. You haven't to give a flying. Do you yeah, know what yeah, I mean? Yeah, yeah. You've to be fearless, yeah. and you've just to do just it. Do it. Yeah. And if you don't, nerves wreck a lot of people with tattooing. Yeah, I bet. Yeah. Like a lot. Yeah. I've seen folk fall apart. With yeah. It. One of my old apprentices. She used to fall apart all the time, and I said to her, look, one day it's just a bit of meat. Yeah. Just treat it as a bit of meat that you tattoo, and it's not a part of a person. That's the only way you're going to get round this, and she did. Right. And she still does it now. Right. She still tattoos now, but back then the nerves were there, and yeah, it was yeah, like, yeah. you've got yeah. to get past yeah. that. So within a month, I was working full-time on an apprenticeship. Apprenticeships then were hard because... Most tattooists back then were owned by lively characters, yeah. to put it in one <laughs> well, way, do you know what yeah. I mean? And every tattoo shop you went into, they were full of folk. You never went into an empty tattoo you shop. No, there was always people in. You yeah. know, and it with Mickey's yeah, back in yeah. Birmingham. Whenever you went in... Yeah, there was always loads of people. You didn't sit in the tattooist and get a tattoo done by just you and him. No. There was half a dozen people in yeah, there. Cracking and having a lot. There were all, all sorts threads. going on. Yeah. Everybody <laughs> had <laughs> issues. Do yeah. you know what I mean? That was the first time I was offered a line of Coke. Was it? Yeah. <laughs> he was all, they were all sniffing Coke. Aye. And he was all jealous. And I was all, no, it's all. Well, I, I can remember being doing Mickey's once. <laughs> And who was it? He used to have a guy. Uh, he used to have a guy work for him called Hagar. Right. And they called him Hagar because he was. Remember Hagar, the horrible, horrible. off the back yeah, of yeah. the sun. Yeah. The little strip thing. Yeah. He was a double of him. Was he? All you could see was a nose and eyes, and the rest was there. Yeah. <laughs> and they'd put a big cup, of, a spoonful of speed in his coffee. 
<laughs> and he was working away, I'll never forget it. <clears throat> and he was working away on this guy, and this guy was getting a panther about that big, yeah. right down his ass. Yeah. And hey, God, always had a fag hanging out of his mouth. I mean, the tattoo shots back then weren't they? Like, were, yeah. were they? <laughs> and I was watching him and I was cracking to him as much as he could talk. And this ash was about that long and it just fell off onto the tattoo. Got his <laughs> and he looked at me and winked and just wiped it off. You know, and you're like, oh, for fuck's sake. <laughs> but tattooists then, they were like bookies, weren't they? Yeah, they were. Uh, you know... Everything nowadays is all like down, back then. The bookies were called turf accountants. Yeah, they were. They're almost like seedy little establishments, yeah, weren't well, they? The tattooists were kind of had that similar vibe. Well, it's right? funny because when I set this shop up in Penrith, part of the bylaws of tattooing is you have to have vinyls on the windows, right. and everybody thinks that's a choice thing, but it isn't. It's the council because it states in the bylaws that tattooists are still classed as undisreputable <laughs> businesses, <laughs> where illegal goings on go on <laughs> <laughs> and that's right that's actually in written the, in, that's in actually bylaws. written in the bylaws and you know and you're like for fuck's sake <laughs> but now it's so socially acceptable isn't it oh it is i but know. i mean i'd, I'd say 60 70 percent of the tattoos now wouldn't have lasted in an old tattoo shop in the no, 90s because no. they were rough places were, and i mean i've seen in mics i've seen it kick off yeah you know i've seen him fighting with folk you know yeah, what I mean? and it's surprised. like well it was it we're you know where it is, Dan, the sort of small Heath part of town, yeah, Spark right. Brook, wasn't it? And um, so I had my first one. I had my first one done in Erdington, and that was done. That was a, a local MC's Aye. parlour, that was. Cause it was always full of choppers outside. Yeah. The first guy that did me was like a, a typical, yeah. you know. Well, a lot of the big cities were run by the bikers, yeah, really. It was yeah. the MC well, side was it. it was either Back then, it was either bikers, villains... Or military that had tattoos, yeah, wasn't it? Uh, no one well, else. You'd say that, but I mean, that was the common perception of it. Yeah. But I always thought that, because I mean, I grew up in the punk era, that was my era, yeah. and we, it was part of kind of, part of that. our tribal thing yeah. to have tattoos yeah, yeah. to be marked up. And it was only when I started tattooing that you realised that there was actually a large percentage of, of women came in for them that were mm. normal folk. Yes. And there was quite a few pensioners. There was one guy, uh, when I first started, he got two tattoos every year, and he didn't start getting tattoos till he retired. No way. And he was a, he was a banker. Was he? He was a bank manager, this guy. And he was a lovely old bloke. Yeah. He's bound to be dead now, yeah. unless he's got the socks. But he used to come in every year and get two little ones. Did he? Yeah. And, like, a friend of mine, she was, I'd say she was... In the late fifties when I, well, the fifties when I started, yeah, and she was a lovely, white-haired woman, yeah, you know, just looked like uh, a happy grandma type. But when she took her top off, she was she absolutely covered. covered, you know, back, chest, arms, you know, it was a lot. And it's one of them. There was always that preconception that it was a job yeah, culture. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It really wasn't. Yeah. There was still. The hardcore collectors yeah, and the yeah. people that didn't want folk to, to know, know they had got tattoos, it. Yeah, yeah. you know what I mean? So, now it's almost like a badge of honour, isn't it? You know? Well, it's funny now. I think now it's it's very much like back in the day, back in the 90s, early 90s, late 80s, early 90s when I started, it was, I'd say one in 20 had tattoos. Now it's one in five. Is it? Is so that, it's that gone. statistic now? Oh, God, it? I, yeah. It's gone full mainstream. Yeah. And now the young lads, like, when I, when we got tattoos, you got a little and start with yeah, to see what it was yeah, like. Yeah. And then you got more. Yeah. Now they come in and they want to fall asleep. Yeah. Well, they go straight for the neck. Or yeah, straight well, for you the see arms, some of them and... It's like, it's, that but, was like the last resort almost back. Well, when, I, when, when we were into it, you got your arms done, then you moved on your chest or your back. Yeah. Or you'd have some on your legs. Legs, yeah. And that was... You moved around and mm. worked onto yeah. them things. It was classically now, the arms first, yeah. right? Always... And now they just go straight in. Yeah. You know, and I like that, and it's good for the business. Yeah, yeah. But it's a different sort of animal now, yeah. do you know what I yeah, mean? Yeah, totally. It's a fashion thing now. I mean, the one that changed it, I think the best two things that happened to tattooing in Britain, the first one was David Beckham. Yeah. Because tattooing was really, it wasn't dying off, but it was still an underground thing in, I'd say, the late 90s. When Beckham... The best thing that could ever happen was the England captain getting tattooed, yeah, you know, yeah. and when that happened, it kind of opened the floodgates. Yeah. 
then Miami Ink and London Ink hit, mainly yeah. Miami Ink. Yeah. And I mean, that's when I was the first one in Cumbria to do appointments only. Right. Then nobody had ever attempted it. Yeah. So I, once that hit, and I'd watched the first season, I'd said to Mike, I'm going to get an appointment only, and yeah. it's spot on perfect. And were you still music. working at his yeah. studio then? So I went appointment only. Yeah. Which was just, I put my prices up and went appointment only, so I was covering what I was losing yeah, by yeah. doing stuff off the walls. And within a week, I was three months fucked up. Wow. Well. Maybe a couple of weeks, you know. Oh, was it but still it just... old school with the, all the potatoes well, on the walls? Well, I always, I, it sounds pretentious and it makes us sound like a prick, but I was responsible for changing the face of tattooing in Cumbria. Right. I was the first one to do Japanese properly. I was the first one to do portraits. Yeah. Nobody had even attempted them. Had they not? No, nobody had even attempted them. I mean, so... that must be rock hard if someone brings a picture in. I'd only been tattooing for two years when I, started, I did my first portrait. It was Jack Nicholson from The Shining on a mate of mine. I thought, I'd seen one at a convention, and I thought, I said, I'm going to have to try this. Yeah. And we did that with his head through the door. I did, yeah. Uh, yeah, Johnny. And it was like, yeah. And it was like, oh, it's cool, that, you know, yeah, it yeah. yeah. So then I started doing I never did them for customers. Right. I was just doing them just on mates of mine. Yeah, yeah. So yeah. I started doing all the film stuff, like Batman and the Mask and... A lot of the Hellraiser stuff, yeah, and, yeah, you know, yeah. uh, a few like Wendy James from Transvision Vamp yeah. and stuff like that. And then it started, customers started seeing them and wanting them done. Yeah, yeah. So it Because a lot of this will have been all pre internet days as well, wasn't it? So yeah, it was well, it was, but the hard thing was getting pictures. A bit, yeah. Because you yeah. couldn't search on the internet. Yeah. You had to find, I mean, back then, I can remember me and Mike talking about it once, and we used to come into the shop if we'd been to another town on the Monday on our day off. Because we worked six days a week yeah. then. And if you found a book, it was gold dust. Yeah. And you'd come in and go, look, I found this. <laughs> and it had good pictures yeah, in yeah. it. So you were yeah. always in the bookshop. Yeah. And that was the old internet for the old tattoos. <laughs> yeah, you know. And there was no tattoo mags then. No. Whereas now everything's online and there's TV yeah, programmes and it's starving. Yeah, yeah. Back then you were just folk looked. You were kind of the rock and roll side of businesses, you yes. know. Yeah, yeah. When you were out, everybody wanted to know you. Yeah. Because <laughs> they wanted cheap tattoos. Yeah. But when you were in the shop, it was, you were constantly working. working. Like, I can remember it died off in about 93, it really died off. Did it? Yeah. Well, I mean, I come into it, when I come into it, I come into it after the whole, because the AIDS thing, I think, played a big hit on the tattoo and yeah before people understood that it the rudiments of it yeah yeah so i kind of come into it on the end of that maybe a few years after the end of that right and then about within there was about three years because in carlisle in the early 90s there was a heroin epidemic was there oh massive yeah kind of about 92 93 and it, a lot of it came off the back of the the rave generation because right, yeah, yeah. as that had its couple of years where it was big yeah a lot of them needed the party to carry on carry, so heroin yeah. came into yeah. it and it, but heroin was bad in carlisle at the time was really it? bad yeah so it kind of killed it a little bit and yeah. everything was dying off because everyone was throwing the money into the drugs on mm. the weekend he was still all right i mean i, I can remember it still out of living but well i can remember booking fork in it once booking two fork in at 10 o'clock at night yeah yeah because it was the only time they could get there yeah. So I'd said to my mate that worked with us at the time, you hang about while, you know, yeah. walk the shop for us, I need bother. Yeah. And it was like, you were working till after midnight because it was the only way to make money, well, you know. So what <laughs> uh, what we did was, we, it was Mike's idea, we put, uh, we got some sales stickers, you know, like yeah. that you'd put in the windows. Yeah, yeah. And we put them on the windows. And they were up for five, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and it was one of them, you were knocking money off. Yeah, you know yeah, what I mean? yeah. But it was the only way to get working because basically yeah. it was, it was, Tattoo was struggling at was the it? time. But then it did for a few years, but then when Beckham hit, it, it just, just it, went. And it's never really stopped, has it? It hasn't. It's, I think, another 10 or 15 year, it'll, I mean, a mate of mine said to us the other week, which was quite an interesting, the other month, he said, you know, if I wanted it to be different now, I wouldn't have any tattoos. Yeah. And that's his idea. Yeah, it. yeah. And he says, I'd get them all removed and not have um, one. Oh, yeah, because and it's, that is, because I had mine done, I suppose, a, for that rebellion type, yeah, you know, I, you know, rebel against yeah. family and all the rest of it. So it was that rebellious side of me that wanted them doing. But now there's such a norm. Oh, I probably yeah. wouldn't have any at all. Well, it's... Or completely be covered one or the other. Uh, I'd like to start again. 
play them, I would hold for it now. I'm 55 now, so... You think? The thought of getting... I could get it done. I know, I know lads that do it, Yeah. The thought of getting it done is like, yeah, I'm our old for that shit now. Because it's changed. I mean? Hasn't it changed? I mean, you all know and you'll tell us how much it's changed, kind of technically. But when we were back, going back to like Mickey Sharps when I was in there, and, and you'd walk in and there'd be a couple of people just sat in the sort of waiting area, and then the walls would be completely oh, yeah, covered oh. with all sorts of things. And then there'd be the odd sort of flip chart book yeah. that you could pick as well, wouldn't there? And so this was what, 80. 86, 87, and yeah. do you remember that panther yeah. with the owls, with the oh, claws? Right. Everybody had that, didn't oh, they? Aye. Well, that was certain tattooists. That was that came through. I think that I think that was Graham Townsend. I think that was one of his was designs. I, which he was one of the better known. Certain tattooists did designs, and you'd have these conventions every year. Conventions were brilliant. They I bet were they were completely brilliant. different to conventions now. They were just wild. I bet they were just you know, mad parties, weren't the, they? The, the conventions now, the good, the last one I was at was uh, at Truman Brewery in London, the big tattoo convention in London. And that was brilliant. That was about four, I don't know how many years ago now, maybe about 16 years ago. I think it was the second one. And yeah. That was fantastic. Was it? Oh, it was brilliant. And it really was. It was well organised, you know. Hundreds of artists on the go, lots of trade stalls, yeah. you know, music on the go, yeah. big bars. It was just a nice chill yeah. thing. But the ones before that, it used to be one at a place called Dunstable near London. Yeah. Uh, Dunstable's joint onto Luton. Right. And every year, uh, Everybody in They'd Britain just met there. there. Yeah. And you know, it was weird because you'd be drinking at the bar with someone the year before that you didn't know everyone was just on the same wavelength. Yeah, yeah. And I mean, this place, you'd have you'd have everything from bankers to the hardest core bikers you could ever meet. Yeah. And everybody got on. There was never yeah, an yeah. answer. Because everyone's there for the same reason. Yeah, it they? was like hitting Amsterdam. Inside them doors, yeah. everything went. Yeah. And it was wild. Yeah. But everyone got on. <laughs> but you'd see the strangest thing. There was this little old guy. <laughs> hey, there was this little, he is a good boy. There was this little old guy. He used to come every year, right? And he yeah. was about five foot. And he used to come in a really posh three-piece suit. Yeah little bald headed bloke pushing a trolley from an airport a luggage yeah, trolley yeah. from an airport and as the day went on they had less and less clothes on <laughs> and by the end of the day he had a little blue thong on <laughs> and he had a little one tattoo with a little tattoo on his ass like that but nobody bothered him and that was his thing all he did he just went just in for that one day just to strip off just to do a slow strip <laughs> and then you'd see him at the end of the day getting back dressed and he'd just say thank you very much to the dorm and thank you and he'd just get home again and he literally had no other yeah, tattoos no apart tattoos, from that little tiny thing, little thing on his ass <laughs> but that was his thing uh, when you got the magazines then you'd see these wild folk in them and there was one guy he must be dead now uh, Michael Kickamore Faddle right and he was in the House of Lords. He was something to do with the House of Lords, kick him off, Faddle. Right. And he wore the monocle. And, oh, yeah. Yes. Oh, yeah. Oh, oh, blue chap. Hello, oh, old chap. And I got on brilliant with him. Yeah. And Mike did. We always got on brilliant. He actually come into Mike's once to get a tattoo. He travelled all the way from London. Did he? Yeah, and he was a proper Lord type. Yeah, he was yeah. absolutely covered. But you used to see him. And, oh, old chap. Oh, you. You know, <laughs> and he'd, he'd be stood with the sherry at the bar and that. Do you know what I mean? But he was a proper character. But he had Popeye tattooed on here with his legs wide open <laughs> and his parts were Popeye's parts. <laughs> and he was known for standing on the stage starkers. Was he? Yeah, he was a, he was a bit of a fakir type <laughs> where he uh, he did he did like the extreme stuff. Oh, did you it? know, uh, you know like a man called Horse. Yeah, yeah, like yeah. That. yeah. Done all oh, did he? Oh, all right. God, I. Well that's quite a big thing that. Uh like a few mates of mine, he met old mate of mine, he, he was a big body piece and he used to do the hooks in the back. Yeah, and, and, and hoist himself Yeah, up his daughter it? often yeah. got, the faces she often got hoisted Hoist, up with yeah. the hooks on the back, just balanced and two hooks holding him in the air like a man called horse. <laughs> but she said it just cleared your mind. She said, didn't it didn't actually was. hurt, no. it just cleared your mind, you know. <laughs> that's oh, that's a big thing, that like. Isn't it? Uh, you, people so, don't see the extreme side so of Pierce and yeah, like yeah. A, a mate of mine lives in Canada now. Uh, but it's not necessarily with BDSM. No, is no, it? this it's, is just It's a nothing thing. kind of well, last time, along them lines. One I know of it's mates, kind of parallel. He lives in Canada now. Last time he did it, he got hung up by his shins. <gasps> he got the hooks put through the skin on his shins. Okay, now. <laughs> 
And that was his choice, you know, and he yeah. went, oh, it was fine. It's like, no, it wouldn't be for me, yeah. that thing. Because yeah. <laughs> you used to see that on telly, well, not to that extreme, but you'd yeah. see the odd ones on, like, you know, the Paul Daniels magic oh, show with uh, yeah. and, and stuff like well, that. Well, there was one last Irene, and she uh, she worked in Manchester. She worked at Lou Milloy at one time, who did Beckham's tattoos. Yeah. And I did all the, all the head for her. Did you? Yeah, and she was lovely. She was lovely, Irene. And uh, I did a big eyeball, a third eye on third her forehead. Eye, yeah. I mean, I did a full head. And uh, her husband, she was she was about six foot six. I think wow. she was a big, big lass, girl. you know, yeah. but lovely, lovely person. Yeah. And uh, she, uh, her husband was a little, just a little guy, really big, beard, curly hair, jolly yeah. type. And I never put them together. Yeah. And I never knew what it was. And then I bumped into him one day at a mate of mine's comic shop in Carlisle. And he went, oh, he says, uh, Irene's on the telly on Saturday. I was going to come and see her. And I says, all oh, right, Channel 4's done a programme of her. And I says, right. And he says, she's gave you a mention. <laughs> and I says, oh, that's very good. He says, because of the edge, she's gave you a mention and that. What, what time's her? And I said, it's on about 11 o'clock. I said, I'll watch it. So I meant to tell my mother, because my mother, proud mother type. Yeah, yeah. But I forgot her and I'm bloody pleased I didn't. Because the programme <laughs> come on. And the first scene of the programme was Irene stood oh, in a full basque. Tying a mate up and then whipping, living all over of it. And she was a proper dominatrix was type. She? Oh, God, I. And you know, and you're like, Christ, I'm pleased I didn't tell my mother about that. And she got had a bloody heart attack, like. But I. But Tattoo One was full of them characters. Yeah, then. yeah. You know, I think a lot of them characters have died off now, like. Yeah, because, it, because it's become almost like a social norm now. Yeah. Those sort of characters have almost got lost I think in now it's the more extreme thing like you see them now like there's a one in france that's got big on tiktok and instagram and these guys fuck go to them to get hurt right and that's the purpose of their tattoo shop and they use big mags and they're doing folks faces and the both these tattooists say we're there to hurt them that's what they want so we hurt them and you can see them in absolute agony. Uh, so yeah. I think the extreme side's kind of gone to that now. Right. And you see for getting their eyeballs <sighs> injected and all of that. Do you know what I mean? What? And yeah, there's a lot of that goes on. I've seen there's there's one guy in particular. He was on <clears throat> he was on telly years ago when he and he'd moved. I think he was an ex forces guy and he'd moved to some crazy little island in, in just off Scotland. Oh, the Leopard Man? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, well, I'm sure he passed away. He, he actually, did he? He actually lived like that for about 15 yeah, years. Yeah, yeah. Well. And somebody told us, I'm not sure whether it's right, it might be wrong, but somebody told us he'd passed away and, uh, a couple of years ago. Cause, but, that's, but even that has become almost normal, yeah. that body modification, hasn't well, it? The, there was a guy in America called Enigma. I think it was Enigma. And he his just... whole body was blue jigsaw. Yeah. But do you know what he, he did? He had coddle grafted onto his skull right because coddles the only thing that will grow on human bone right. so he had it so grafted on his skin so he has horns yeah and i think he's having to, he's tried or he's had it taken off now do you know what i mean but his wife's the same his wife's head to toe it's like a tiger is she yeah but there was a guy years ago and he was a big computer programmer in america and he got his full body and his face done like a tiger yeah but he had his teeth done. Yeah, the teeth done and everything, didn't they? But he had his he had his implants put in his face so it looked like a tiger's muzzle. Right. And then he had screwing implants for uh, things. I uh, I think he's passed away Is now he? and all. Uh, a lot of them characters have gone, eh? Yeah. And then, then they get their tongues completely split. Yeah, my right, mate's got that. Has he? Uh, he's got that. Uh, I think that's a normal thing now, to that's be honest with you. I suppose, because even like piercing the tongues yeah. and piercing's in general, you know, we thought we were rebels piercing our ears oh, back in the yeah. sort of 80s. Uh, so, <laughs> well, I had loads. But it's now, yeah, because you've got the big, what do they call that when it's oh, just the poked, Is that what it's called? Uh, is it? Well, I had them up to 24s, and then I had about 13 in that meeting that and I had loads in this face. Because obviously, just took different in cultures there. in the world, it's just their part of their... Yeah, well, that was a punk culture, their, that yeah. everyone, it was acceptable, yeah, you know, yeah. everyone had piercings, piercings in the punk time, yeah, you know. yeah. But where there's now, I think, I don't know, I think there's not the freaks anymore, or what folk used to call the freaks. Yeah. You know, but you used to meet, I can remember one of the first lads that got his full face done, uh, which was 
who kind of went on record and became quite famous off it, which was Carl. And right. he, Carl was from down your way. Was he? he? Was, yeah, he was. I think he was Coventry Carl. Right. Uh, he had all his face done. He ended up on postcards Did and magazines. He? I bumped into him at a convention one day. Right. This was a big guy. Yeah. I mean, a big, big. blow. Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> but he, uh, the nicest bloke he could meet. But you see, there, there's a perfect example. In this country, it was like, oh, shocking. This, yeah. It, and yet, if it was in New Zealand, Nothing. it's just a norm. Yeah. Isn't it? Because it's part of, their, part of their culture. Part of their Maori culture, isn't but, it? So. I mean, it's. But they don't like anybody that's not Maori getting them, eh? Yeah, I can imagine. That's a big part yeah. of it. And I understand that. Cause yeah. that's their Especially culture. if it's their sort of tribal designs yeah. as well. But that kind of. It spills over into other stuff. That I can remember working in Liechtenstein with some mates of mine once. And, uh one of my pals at the time he luca he's uh massive into japanese they reckon his shop's like a dictionary you know this right. guy he's even married the japanese last Luca. Yeah. he's a great lad luca he's a proper good laugh he's just a character you yeah, know yeah. what i mean yeah he's obsessed with japanese is it but he's good at it he yeah. does a proper traditional style and he's, does he do it with the i think he's done a bit of that with the tabori but yeah. he mainly does electric machines but this right. guy's good at it and he keeps it really traditional and yeah, yeah. he's worked at it because the thing with japanese what folk don't realize is you've got to research it for about two years solid to get it right there's certain things that you shouldn't mix with other things i do like japanese but i do my own style of westernized of it right yeah whereas luca's full-on japanese full on proper traditional yeah he yeah. even pauses and has them posing around him he's, this guy does full body suits on right. you know, he's, he's worked his way to get there yeah, he's yeah, done well he yeah. travels the world did it but uh <clears throat> he was having an argument with klaus fernham now klaus fernham is i think he's an austrian artist klaus right he, he's out there you know he was he kind of where the biomet came in which was there which was uh, what was his name that created the alien giga hr giga right that kind of came in and there was a guy from america called guy hinson he kind of took it and made it his own and yeah, yeah. turned it into a tattoo and style and then you've got guys like klaus fernham that kind of took it and took it to the next step but he was having an argument with me mate, and i thought what's all this about so i kind of got close and they were arguing about japanese and right. it goes back to the thing you were saying about the the maoris where they don't like other folk getting them and klaus fernand was saying you're good at japanese you're very good at japanese but you'll never be accepted by the japanese, japanese and he yeah. says i will i will and he says you won't because you're not japanese yeah and that's what it all comes down to yeah every kind of country has its own style yeah. and unless you're kind of in amongst that type of person they won't accept it yeah. it is changing now yeah but back then they were terrible oh, yeah they wouldn't even tell really you really territorial the, it oh, they wouldn't tell you the secrets nah. you know yeah. i mean there is there's a certain amount of secrets to japanese tattooing to do this style properly i learned them when i was working with a mate of mine in italy yeah and he was told them off a japanese guy and he said i was lucky to be told them. right whereas everyone knows them now but yeah, back yeah. then which we live in about 15 years ago nobody knew them so it was quite an honor to find out this yeah stuff, yeah you know what yeah. i mean but I well, it been like sort of because i'd imagine it's the movements it's with the japanese everyone goes for really complicated where it shouldn't be should yeah just flow almost well like your a... main character should be quite static and bold yeah but the movement should be in the background but the movement of the background should always contradict the main character that you put on whereas the main character should be in color right the background should always be in black and gray all oh, right and i watch people try and change it yeah, and it's yeah. like you can't change yeah. what's written for years yeah you yeah, know what I mean? yeah that's like centuries that'll have been yeah the well i mean wouldn't it i'd say japanese tattoo when are responsible for the pictorial tattoos we've got now and the color would you say as well yeah i mean it's only recently with japan that they've been allowed to have shops been owned because it, it was kind of the only in it and yeah. big areas and i don't use a lot of lines in the background now right. mine are quite fluid yeah. backgrounds and i've started lately doing like i did a penton and a lad jumped on it a lad i know is a good lad it was a big food dog yeah. and i've basically just done the food dog on his arm that's all there is and then there's a big mask and i mean the mask's about that big on the back of his arm you know Christ. everything's massive and full yeah, color yeah. With, yeah and it really works but to get to that styles took us about 
15, 20 years. Is it? To, yeah, because what I used to do, I used to spend two or three years doing something. Like for two years, all I did was draw things on. Everything yeah. I did was free on, the, unless it was a portrait. Yeah. Everything was drawn on. I didn't stencil anything. Right. And then I spent a couple of years spending as much time as I could just doing Japanese. And then I spent as much time as I could doing another style. And I kept doing that. So I was basically, I'd learned as much as I could. And there's very few artists like me now. When most artists now, they'll do one or two styles. I cover every style in the book. And there's no, there's not, not, not many, there's not many all round. Do it. Yeah, there. yeah. So a lot of them will just go for like black and grey. Yeah. Or they'll just colour. I've warned a lot of them. And I mean, I've said to them, look, you're going to kill yourself off. Yeah. And I've seen a mate of mine recently, he's only ever done one style, he's having to move into other styles right. now because yeah, yeah. that style's dying well, off. it does, doesn't it? Yeah. You know, it, it, even though it is kind of fashionable, but the fashions change within the fashions, yeah, don't they? Yeah, and that's the thing. Once, once, you st once your style dies off, you're playing catch-up yeah. because all these other people have been doing that style for years. Yeah, you yeah. Know. So you're going to go to the person that's good at it, yeah, aren't you? It's, it. it's last Last for your life. It does. So you ain't going to go to someone who's just. But you know. the problem is, you've still got a certain amount of fork. They think of the price before they think of quality. Yeah. And it doesn't work yeah. like that. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. yeah. And it'll be like, oh, well, I can get it filmed a quid cheaper down yeah. the road. They say, I mean, I get fork knocking on my door all the time. And they'll say, do you do walkings? No, I don't. No. And I always pull them to one side now and say, look, if you can walk into a shop, walk back out. What do you mean? Well, there's a reason you can walk Walking. into that shop. Yeah. Oh, I see what you mean, eh? Yeah. Everybody else is booked up. Yeah. If they're not booked up, walk back out yeah. because you'll end up with some yeah. shite on. Because it was, it was totally different back in the 80s oh, and right. 90s. Totally different. Well, you had to it's... get to the Say on a Saturday, for instance, you had to get to the shop as early as, as you could. As early as you could, yeah. And you were there all day. <laughs> you, you were literally, if you, yeah. if you wanted to go out and get something to eat, yeah. you had to let us know yeah. you were going out for something to eat or you lost your place. Yeah. Yeah. And it was accepted. Yeah. You know. And the amount of times you'd go to the tattooist first beforehand because you knew you didn't want to waste time yeah. picking something off the wall. Uh, so you go first, you, you go, you pick it, and then. But I've had a couple of couple of mine because I don't know about you, but I had a load of Indi like homemade ones uh, first. Uh, I think we all. Ah, uh, the that. Indian so, ink. Yeah, uh, the old it... Indian ink. And then the one guy, I was on the YTS, and this one guy, he converted. Um, an old like electric razor yeah and he'd put a pin in oh, the end of that okay. and he was so it was still all wrapped in um cotton as normal oh, but then this electric razor was constantly so instead of jabbing it into yourself by that right. this, this electric razor oh, was, i did my first one on my mate's neck like that did that you was an old razor i and then i got into tattooing and it was different yeah you know, it's totally different how do you find that the, the your art kind of crosses over it you, would you, is it not at all no. so you don't necessarily have to be a well it, if you're it, it, if, it, doesn't if you're a great tattooist you're not necessarily a great artist no, no. but it's that I, I think there's a lot of tattooists there now because you can buy the stuff online you can even buy it on amazon right which is bad it's not regulated and because there's that you're getting a lot of bad tattooists right. and there's there's some medium grade tattooists, there's some brilliant tattooists, yeah. you know. But you need the medium grade, the good and the brilliant because there's certain people that want a certain style. Yeah, yeah. There's certain people that want a brilliant style. Yeah. So you need to cater for all them people, but there's also them folk, especially nowadays, that don't have a lot of money in the pocket, yeah. so they can't afford. Because some of them are charging stupid money nowadays, like yeah. stupid money. So they can't afford to throw big money at it. So you do need that as well. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. Everything's affordability because folks still want tattoos. Yeah. It all depends. If your budget's not high, especially with the living costs yeah, nowadays, yeah, yeah. do you know what I mean? Yeah. So, like, I've always tried to keep it affordable for folks so they're getting decent work at an affordable price. But even that can kill you, you know what yeah, I mean? So yeah. sometimes... Yeah, because you've still got to make a living. You've got to have. Isn't it? And you I know. mean, sometimes you can... I've seen folk nearly kill themselves off doing it. Really? You know, like a mate of mine last year, I'd said to him, you need to put your prices up. Yeah. What do you mean? I said, well, your work's brilliant, but you're working at too low a price. Yeah. And he has yeah. gone up now. Yeah. But it's still affordable. Yeah. 
you yeah. know, where there's some folk put a too high a price on the I name. I've seen some folk working at like I know there's some of them in other countries that are working for five grand a day. <sighs> fucking stupid ain't it nobody's worth that much jesus i get man. it that you're a big name but you go to certain conventions these big conventions and there's certain rows of tattoos that's known as millionaire row really you know but there's a lot of them through the past i mean mickey shafts for example mickey changed the face of tattooing in britain did he oh absolutely because yeah. I, sh- I was mega shocked when i told you i'd had him done that you knew who he was I oh thought, well he used to go to was, mickey's shop in was, Spark Hill, yeah right? he was gonna yeah. know it was going to know, you know, to, virtually a lot. We used to set up at six o'clock in the morning and drive down to Mickey's, but that's the thing. Mickey was, Mickey supplied machines, Mickey supplied needles, right. Mickey yeah, supplied yeah. colours. Yeah. He had a big supply business on yeah. the door as well. Uh, but I, Mickey was, I'd say, there was an old Madeline Monroe portrait he did, which was one of the first portraits I ever seen tattooed, which right. was brilliant. Uh, and Japanese... But I can remember Mickey doing a back piece years ago, and it was a Japanese back piece, and it was full on Japanese stuff. Yeah. yeah. But it was uh, a big skeleton demon thing riding a JCB. <laughs> it was mad, but it worked. And you know, <laughs> yeah. you're like, he, you know, he was doing big, like, full back pieces of Ganesh and stuff yeah, like yeah. that, and stuff that folk didn't catch up with until like 20 years down yeah, the line. Yeah, yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. So I, Mickey was quite a forerunner in yeah, the tattooing yeah, game. Like, yeah. And a very clever bloke. He was a nice bloke. He was, yeah. spot on. You know, Absolutely I think he was in Devon originally or somewhere like that. He yeah. didn't kind of fit in in the area. <laughs> yeah. we didn't, cause that was a big Muslim area, yeah, Spark, Spark Hill, Hill, wasn't Hill, it? Yeah, yeah. It was an Indian restaurant, yeah, and takeaways yeah. and dodgy shops. Yeah. Uh, Mickey... Uh, it was definitely... I don't know what it's like now to anyone listening from Birmingham, but back then it was definitely a... A more run-down yeah, it was, side right. of the city. I, can, I, got, I mean, I can remember across the road from him there was a car dealership. And I was quite shocked because there were all these nice cars and I went to have a look at the cars one day and they all had crap wheels on and no radios in. And I was like, what's the crap there? So, well, if they leave them with the wheels on, the wheels will go on. And they'll <laughs> and the radios. Radios. <laughs> <laughs> and it was like, right, right, right. You get, get, that you know. get that fear when you yeah, bought it. Yeah, it was a bit, but you went to different areas, you know. There was uh, Balsaleith. Yeah. I mean, that was a bit like Amsterdam. Yeah, yeah, just, up, the just up the road, yeah. And I mean, it was red light. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That, yeah. What was the other one? Was it Answorth? Answorth, yeah, Answorth. Uh, yeah. That was a bit dodgy. Like, yeah, well, that's where we, I first scored my first um, <laughs> marijuana because you know, uh, yeah, it was a totally different animal than it is today you know nowadays you can see the local scully riding around on his little electric scooter yeah. and his tracksuit and you know he'll, he'll supply you with every drug oh, known right, to man yeah. wouldn't he but back then you you went where the drugs were oh and well it was, I mean I can remember we were driving past him not got, that I'm a druggie but we've <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah, laughs> yeah. uh, got uh, <laughs> we got to Birmingham, we went one Sunday night instead of going on there, because we used to have at six o'clock in the morning to go to Mickey's. Yeah. And we used to have a slow jaw sure down and come back that yeah. night, but we decided to go on the Sunday night this time. So we were driving around Birmingham, just having a drive about. And we were going past Answorth, and there was a car in front of us flying, and it just literally flew off the road, smashed into another car, all the doors opened up, four lads jumped out and ran into Answorth. <laughs> and it was kind of, the, it was like, Tower blocks yeah. as the entrance to it was like the gates to hell, you know what I mean? <laughs> and it was like, my god, and it was like, yeah, that's a dodgy area, we won't be got any in there. there. <laughs> but I mean, I kind of liked it, I think mean, it was all right, uh, you know. There I was mean, some... I, I loved I loved growing up there, mm. do you know what I mean? It was fantastic. I wouldn't swap my sort of youth to growing uh, up because there was so much to do. See, I never had that. I, yeah. I grew up in pubs, so. We moved from town to town to right. city to town, you right. know what I mean? So yeah, I yeah. did like eight schools. Maybe. Oh, did you? Uh, all so kind of in the north, though, all around here? Well, we did. Uh, God, where did we go? We started off in Carlisle and then uh, Corby Hill and then Kendall and a place called Darwin in Lancashire, right? Uh, which is near Blackburn, and then a place called Colm right. in Lancashire. Uh, Colm's kind of a weird place to describe it. So it kind of joined on to a place called Nelson. Right. Uh, Nelson then was kind of a big Muslim area. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and then we moved to Chester. Right. 
Chester was a good place. We were right on the river side in Chester. Was you? Oh, it was brilliant. That was, we spent a couple of years there. But that was the thing. I mean, I can remember Darwin. We did six months in Darwin. Yeah. So you don't get any education yeah, yeah, at yeah. all, you know. You don't get a chance to make any pals or nothing. No, there, yeah. so I kind of became very much the loner through yeah, my life. And yeah. I was quite happy that way. Yeah. You know? Well, you do. I mean, I've always, well, I've had some, I've got, and I've still got some really good mates, but I'm more than happy in my own company yeah I am uh, you know what I mean I don't necessarily need yeah. anyone I'm, I could quite happily just get lost in my own thoughts I like my own and, life eh? yeah. I'm the same yeah. you know, the wife and the kids that's my happy place yeah. you yeah. know and it really is but pardon me I think when the punk scene kind of changed me a lot I think this I'm one of them where I think you go through cycles in life yeah you know it was like 100% we, Oh, I and I mean, we at Carlisle, I landed back at Carlisle when we were 13. Well, all my right. family was from Carlisle. Yeah, yeah. And then you kind of move on. You'll have done it yourself. Yeah. I mean, moving up here, will yeah. a big oh, yeah, yeah. change for you. Yeah. But if you yeah. don't grasp it. Yeah. And I've seen folk do it. They move to other towns and they can't handle it. Yeah. And it's like, I got used to it in a young life. Yeah. A young yeah. age, it was just moving about yeah. normal, you know. But, it, but you do, you see people... Even now, I've seen people that have moved up here and they're still almost very much like an outsider. Yeah. You know, they haven't grasped that, the local, oh, yeah. you know, whatever, you know Well, what it I mean? was like we moved in the, recent, well, three years ago, we moved into the village outside Penrith. And it was a good, I'm used to it. The wife had lived, where we'd lived over Gillsland. She'd lived there all yeah. her life. She was green at Gillsland. That was her life. And it was a big thing for her. For me, it wasn't. Yeah. And like... She said to us one day, you know, everyone in this village already, after about two months. And I said, no, because I speak to people. Yeah, yeah. You know, and it's just, I says, I says, you know, she says, I say hello to folk, and they just hire and walk past. And yeah. she's like, what do you say? I say, hiya. Why, what do you say? I says, I say, how are you doing? How are you doing? Yeah. She says, it opens a conversation. She <laughs> says, that it works every time a folk, yeah. whether they want it or not, we'll yeah. stand and have a crack yeah. with you, you know what I mean? Sometimes if you haven't got time, yeah. it's hiya. Quick wave and away you go. Yeah. If you've got enough time to put in banter. Hi. How are you doing? And I it's... mean, in, in my job, you've got to be a good conversationist because yeah. I sit yeah. with three, three hours with at people, a time. Yeah. See, I, that's why kind of one of the reasons I've started the podcast as well is because I meet so many interesting people at the store, yeah. but I only get like little snippets uh, of information. I've said that to you in the past. And it's kind of like, God, if I've only had an yeah. opportunity to talk to someone like we are now, oh, you know, for an hour or so, yeah. or longer. And plus, friendships are formed that way. Exactly. You know, and a lot yeah. of folk don't get they that. Don't, they don't. The amount of people I've got now that are classed as friends yeah. from the store, because you can't, you're meeting people... And they're on the same wavelength as you. Yeah. And you know yourself, someone will walk into your studio and instantly, probably without even opening their mouth, you've yeah. clicked, haven't you? Because right. you're on that same frequency. Oh, right. yeah. Whereas other times, you think, God, this is going to be hard. This yeah. is going to be hard. Well, <laughs> it's kind of hard in my job because, I mean, nowadays, most folk come in with the numb and cream on. Yeah. And it's a big thing. Do they? Yeah, oh, it's massive. A lot of tattooists won't, like, there's one mate of mine, like, a lot of tattooists won't have people with numb and cream on, right? <laughs> right? And there's a mate of mine, he's very well known, I won't say his name, <laughs> uh, but he's a very well known tattooist. And he, he states categorically on his page on Instagram, I do not tattoo folk with numb and cream, Mexican milky, it doesn't. It yeah. does with the odd person, but right. very few. And he won't have fork have it on. Right. And every time he comes to my shop for a tattoo, he's he has covered it. In it. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm like, you contradict me. Like, you know, I do. Uh, it's like, you know, it's one of them. I get it, but uh, I, it's, it's. I mean, a, when did that start? It started about, I'd say, 11, 12 years ago. And it, it started with a thing called Supernum, which came from America. Right. You used to get the one, remember the cream that they used to have for kids where they used to put it on their hands in hospitals? Yeah, yeah. And so a lot of folks started using that, but it was about five for a little tube. Right. You needed loads. Yeah, yeah. I tried it once, and it was all right, but it just numbed the lines. But right. you get some stuff now. And it, three hours, folk will sit with it. And yeah. to be honest, it's a dream for me because... They're not fidgeting. And they're not wind, jumping, yeah. they're not feeling it. The crack on. And yeah. The last hour, they'll start to feel it. But usually with tattooing, I do three-hour sittings. The first couple of hours, folk are set up for it. The last hour, they start to drop, and I'll let them be quiet. Yeah. And then, but it's like, 
that's the truck driver time. Like truck drivers spend all the time in their own heads. Yeah, you know yeah, what I mean? And yeah. that's your truck driver time. Yeah. You're stuck in your thoughts. Yeah, yeah. Years ago, it used to be worse before the creams. I knew it, the folk wouldn't talk. Folk were pa before Miami Inc. Folk used to pass out and pee. <laughs> you kidding, oh, you know? absolutely, are yeah. Well, even on sort of smallish towers or big jobs. Oh, big ones either build them. So the, that was the good thing about folk. Don't realise how much it changed. Like once Miami Inc. came on and they showed you the lassies sitting getting six, seven hour tattoos. Yeah. And just was, sitting through it. Yeah. Folk were like, oh, it is bad about yeah, yeah. Lost. Folk started to lose the fear of yeah. them and get bigger stuff. Yeah. Whereas before that, a Saturday, God, you could lose an hour on a Saturday. Could you? With folk pass just away. passing out. Oh, and folk, you know, wow. feeling sorry for themselves. <laughs> and, you know, some of them would, you know, I just need a break. I just need a break. And just, oh, <laughs> yeah, you know, and you lose the money. That's what they yeah, don't realise. Yeah, and there wasn't yeah. a lot of money in it. Yeah. And you were working yeah. from now, you know I what I mean? Yeah, but, yeah. Uh, I think now folk are more set up for it and if they're not they just get the cream and right that one came from america it was i think it was super numb it was called right and it kind of it worked for about an hour and a half but a mate of mine i've tattooed this lad he's a good mate of mine and i've tattooed him for 35 years my first ever regular customer yeah and i still tattoo him he was in on saturday i still tattoo him to this day i mean we've done Come certain parts of his arms twice right I've done his back twice. I've done the original piece I did. I've covered it up and now we're working on his last leg and this lad's got a full body suit. Yeah, yeah. But then we're going to go back on his arms and recover them. Right. You know, so that's the plan anyway. But he was the first one to use it and I says to him, what's the crack? Yeah. And he went, I've done my pain, Chris. Yeah. And I thought, I says, I, <laughs> you're deuce. absolutely yeah. right. Yeah, yeah, You know what I mean? Yeah. You, you kind of... Yeah. Because there are certain the parts of your body that uh, are Everywhere, a lot more. man. <laughs> folk always say to me, and I love it to wind them up, they'll, they'll say to us, do you still get them on, Chris? And I would say, fuck that, they hurt too much. <laughs> and you can see them kind of looking at you sort of thing, yeah. So the last night I had was on my neck. Uh, I was off a mate of mine in Newcastle. But I just don't get time to get there, no, you know what I yeah, mean? Kids, yeah. I've got two young kids, yeah. so there's no time but, with but that. But they are, I don't know what it is about them, and everyone will probably agree with this, they're just so addictive, aren't they? Mm. I don't know what it is, maybe it's some sort of endorphin rush you get off when you're having it, or what? I think it's dare to be different, yeah. thing, isn't it? You know, it's kind of... I think once the fear was lost of it, and I, I think social media is a big thing, but I think the likes of Geordie Shaw and that, I mean, that Kyle from Geordie Shaw. Right. Uh, it was a lad at Carlisle originally that was tattooing him, and he he was a big, I'd say he was a big protagonist at the time of getting tattooing, if protagonist is the right word, uh, of getting it kind of more socially acceptable and all the young started jumping on it right yeah yeah because he was posting it up constantly and right. then he had that other lad that came into geordie show he had a full, full body, body suit right and these people and then you've got what's it called that love island and all of that a lot of them come on and they're heavily yeah tattooed, yeah you know? like you say, it is now I, th I think the producers look for these yeah, people yeah. and it's like right he looks good he's got the wide yeah, awake body you yeah, know what i mean yeah. he looks like he keeps himself fit yeah, you know yeah, yeah. Whereas most of my ta most of my a lot of my work I don't do that many youngins most of mine are, are around about just below or around our age. Are they? Uh, yeah, most of right. mine's any uh, newbies or yeah, a lot. But, I, really, really, I, see, they've got to a, probably always wanted one, but because of their job, see, or because of their... it's one. Of, see, the problem I've got the like I get a lot coming to me, but I've got this myth that follows me because I'm like Cumbria's longest Serve. reigning constantly like longest serving constant serving tattooist right. i'm cumbria's longest i've had another breakfast i've done 35 years right. solid yeah yeah uh and there's this myth that i'm booked up like six months a year in advance <laughs> yeah. and folk actually tell us about it and i'll i've got customers that will say to us you know i was talking to a lad the other day and he, i'd said i'd booked him with you and he says how the fuck do you get in with him yeah and he says, I messaged him. And he went, no, he's booked up a year in advance. And he went, no, he's not. And I'm not. Yeah. But folk have this misconception that I am. Yeah, I'm not, so get, get in, in touch. <laughs> <laughs> but folk have this misconception that I am, and it can kill you off. But I don't put hardly anything on social media. No. And I'm running eight and nine week ahead, booked up. Yeah, so yeah. For, 
I'm I'm lazy and I'm stupid that way. I can't be bothered with social media. Well, I'm do you too think old. it's just it's, it's our yeah our generation? It is. Isn't it? I mean, I did a thing on TikTok last year, and I said to the wife, I had loads of pentons like artworks and I said to the wife I'm going to go on TikTok and see how long it takes us to get a thousand followers yeah and she says well you need a thousand before you can do certain Stuff, things yeah so it took us six weeks to get a thousand followers right and it was like oh that's doable yeah but I've never been in it since no. <laughs> it's yeah. like I proved that now yeah and that's the stupidity <laughs> you know and you're like you should have kept it going you'd have never been <laughs> up to 10,000 followers now <laughs> but yeah it's like I'd, if I had somebody that do it every week for yeah, 20 yeah. quid that would be crazy. Yeah, Because yeah. actually, you wondered, you wondered to yourself, because we've got busy lives, we've got families, we've got businesses yeah. to run, and then pissing about on TikTok and yeah. and things like that as well. And I know potentially there's money to be made there as well. Oh, there's a lot of money to be made. But it's kind of like, you've got to find, yeah. the, you know, yeah, do you want to have a life? Well, it's, Or do you just want to... Yeah, it, I think it's one of them now, like, you've got this, and it's working for you, and yeah. you enjoy it. I don't That's enjoy it. That's the thing. thing. Yeah. I've got... Pardon me, I've got the artwork. Now, I spent three years solid trying to launch it as a business, and that was the mistake I made. And it's only recently, like since Christmas, I've sat back, and I was working every night till 11 at night. Yeah, you would take yours, you'd come to And it used yourself. to screw us up. Yeah. You know, my head yeah. was gone sideways, yeah. and it was like, the kids weren't getting the time on yeah. them, and it was yeah. like, and since Christmas, I've levelled it back. Yeah. But I says to the wife the other week, I need to be doing this for enjoyment. Yeah. Not to make money yeah. for enjoyment and a bit yeah it'll just evolve then yeah well i'm doing a peacock at the minute for fuck's sake <laughs> talk about oh, talk about a picture doing your head in i bet it will be well the problem is the world's worst jigsaw but actually making the jigsaw it full, is it? but I've, i started using licensed images which you can produce up to half a million copies of them right but you pay for the images yeah so i've started using them but then i didn't like the image so typical me i started adding stuff well that I taught myself to paint uh, and well in oil colours, yeah. in acrylics, uh, watercolours. I taught a lot of them myself. I used to sculpt. Did you? I, 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 I've sold quite a few uh, sculptures on the World Sci Fi market. Have you? Yeah, I did one of uh, Bane getting his back broken off Batman, yeah. uh, which a mate of mine bought off us and produced. What, just from literally a lump of clay? You yeah. Just, wow, uh, that's and amazing. Then Freddy Krueger. No way. And it's funny, you know, I'm Lalan, she's seven. You've got two kids, one's ten and one's seven. And for a birthday, one of her friends got an air, just an air drying clay kit. Yeah. And the other day I'd went in and she'd had a go with it and the wife went, have a look at them. And I said, did you help her? And she went, no, no, they were fantastic. You know, and you're like, oh, I said, she's going to have talent there. Talent. Like, yeah. But I, I did, remember when Mars Attacks, the film? Yeah. I did a life-size bust of the Emperor of that. <laughs> it yeah. was 35 kilos in weight when it was cast. <laughs> and my mate made a cast of it. My mate, he had a shop down south, and he used to, I just used to swap them for models off him because I liked the model kits at the yeah, time. Yeah. Like that. There was a big thing called garage kits. Right. Which, <laughs> it was kind of a loophole in the law. You could produce licensed product, but if you put them down as a garage kit, they were produced in your garage as an unlicensed product, right. and you could get away with right, it. Yeah, yeah. And it was just a loud loophole. So yeah. there was, I actually got in a book called UK GK, which was UK Garage Kits, yeah. and I got me three sculptures in it. But everyone used to put a different name in. So to avoid getting known who it was, it went in as, because I had loads of Pearsons at the time, so it went in as Chris Pearson. <laughs> <laughs> I've still got the book to me today. Hi. But I, so I just used to do swapsies with him, and then I got to know folk throughout it. It was quite random, like I was at a convention at Newcastle once, and I bumped into this big biker guy. Well, my mate might come over to us and says, he's got alien sculptures over there. I was right into all the, yeah, the sci-fi yeah, stuff yeah. then, so... I went out and it was a big biker guy, big massive bloke, lovely bloke, Brian it was. I haven't seen him for years, Brian from Newcastle. And uh, I got cracking to him and I'm like, do you sell these? Like, aye, aye, aye. And I'd get them off someone and then I'd just sell them on. I said, yeah. I'd like to buy a few of these. So I ended up buying a few off him. Yeah. Well, I ended up pals with him and gone to his house. And it turned out this guy used to do the covers for the Sega games. You kidding? Ah, that's what it was. I he so actually like designed a... his stuff was amazing. He got yeah, in his yeah. house, it was like it was like a museum of oddities. <laughs> he just, oh, he like had like that. motorbikes on the wall, oh, and you know, he had so like. Uh, we'll have to get him on the show. Oh, he was, knocking the I, I haven't seen him for years. 
it looked like 20 years. <laughs> right. uh, he was good age then, Brian, but he was a lovely bloke. And I mean, he'd have airbrushes that were like 100 quid, and I'd gone, oh, a lovely airbrush, that, and he'd gone, here, just have it, man. <laughs> you know what I mean? Just have it, just take it with you. The last time I seen him, he was designing a, a water park or a theme park for somewhere in Turkey. Was it? Oh, uh, this bloke just seemed to get himself in the, right, the right places. places. Yeah, 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 but he was a hell of just, just an interesting it's, bloke. Yeah, yeah. Hey, just one yeah. of them blokes that you meet, and he had like. What a life. I can remember walking past some of his house, and I what's that? And I had a mate with us, and my mate goes, I know what that is. And I says, What is it? And he goes, oh, It's a deep, t- a deep space telescope. And it was just this big frame with a little lens, yeah, and then this, this big, enormous... massive lens set yeah. in it. And he was explaining, he was a very, very clever bloke, yeah. you know, but yeah. he was very, very switched on. Right. But it was like, God, that's unbelievable. That's like, aye, the stuff he had. It's just a fork you bump into. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You'll bump well, that's, into that's it. That's it. And you just, you know, people that you'll, you'll have known for a while, and then they'll just say something, and yeah. it opens up this door that you never oh, knew existed like, with yeah. them. It's like, Jesus Christ, I would never have thought that in a million years. Yeah, and I mean, they, I think, I think most people keep stuff quiet yeah because yeah. they're either embarrassed or they don't want the folk yeah, to know yeah you know yeah. it's like you with this you will have thought about this for a long, a long time, time before yeah. you jumped on yeah. it you know yeah. but now i'm on it you're in it yeah you know what i mean and then it, it, it's it's going to be used as a almost like a platform for people that want to tell their stories yeah well. i think that's a good thing do you know what i mean so it's, I not, think it's too, not sorry it's not about me yeah this is just I'm just hosting an environment so people can come in because everyone wants to listen to a story. They do. Some, and everybody's got a story. Yeah. So, oh. And it's like when you go to, um, on the motorway services, there's no... No personalisation. There's no, yeah, it's all, it's all these keyboard things yeah. and you pick your food, you go to the, the hatch and you just a number. You know, no one's cracking or talking yeah. to one another. And then there's this, this metal universe that's started yeah, I, see, I think that's going to screw everything it, up you know people rather than actually going out and walking in the woods or walking out in nature or going to the seaside they'll rather just sit in their house and yeah, do it virtually i was watching a thing talking to someone the other week and they were on about something this is the dread this thing about this guy and he lives in a little bed sit but every weekend he'll go and sit in his mansion in the metaverse and watch a film <laughs> and it's like well why don't you go out the pictures and interact with for yeah but that's the world they create. Yeah, yeah. I think it's going to end up like that. Have, did you see that film, Ready Player One? Or something? Yeah, yeah, yes. It's yeah. going to go down that There's line. There's so many films that are kind of, you're thinking, is it's this a warning, be... isn't it? <laughs> are, these, are these warnings of like I, I mean, the future? You're like me. It's, it's, uh, you overthink things a bit. I, don't, know, I but... don't think you do overthink things. Like we were watching... The Pirates of the Caribbean last night. Yeah. And it was about with the tattooing. I think there's still a lot of changes to come in tattooing, getting back to that, you know. I think tattooing hasn't gone into full circle yet. Do you not think? No. I noticed there's a lot of people going back to the, the old school yeah. ones, isn't there? I think it needs like the old thinned out. 1950s style tattooing. See, they've always been big. Uh, but that's very much a style now, the dress to that style. Yeah, you know, yeah, like yeah. the lasses of the little dresses, you know, yeah. and the, 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 the B.I. Vest yeah. styles and all of that. Yeah. That became kind of a big thing. Because I suppose it, a lot of it, 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 it goes hand in hand with fashion, doesn't it? Yeah. And you all know that there's certain sort of fashions that always have a particular style yeah. of tattoo, weren't there? So it'd be like the sort of rockabilly teddy boy yeah kind of that there's still that a lot of, of that there's quite a lot of that on tiktok is there but they seem to get a lot of stuff on the foreheads and the side of their heads Did they? No. Ah, yeah ah, there was a one there was quite a famous one i think they kind of follow him i can't remember his name but he had two swallows on either corner of his forehead yeah yeah and they look good yeah, yeah. you know and he'd have teds down the side but yeah, i've yeah. seen a lot of them on tiktok lately with quite a lot but the face is quite a big thing now. Yeah. You know, I don't do faces. I refuse to do, do them. You? Yeah, it's not. just awkward. Eh? Yeah, yeah. You know, and but it's, it's surprising how many people will just go. Oh, and I know yeah. these lads that customers, and they've had the necks done right up to like, so they look like got polar necks sweaters yeah. on, and they've got stuff all over, little bits and bobs all over the face, 
and nothing on their arms. And yeah, that gets me. It's like that. that I just can't because it with us. That's where way. Like we said earlier, that's where you start. See, that's for effect. Yeah. That's just to say, look at me. Yeah. You know, and that's not getting to the point where, you, like, like we said before, you you used to have to earn that thing. Yeah. You know, to get up to that yeah. point. Yeah. Because you know, if anyone in the past, you'd know if anyone had sort of visible. Oh. Uh, that they were covered. Yeah. And that, this was like their last. Oh well, I see them now, young lads. I mean, there was I got them knocking on my door, and there was a couple knocked on my door last summer. Our son wants his first tattoo. How old is he? Well, he's eighteen in July he wants his first one but he wants it on the back of his hand it's bloody nice yeah. well he wants that's what he wants that's his first he's 18 year old why would he want the back of his hand done at 18 yeah. he'll regret that in years to come yeah. what's he wanting on it it was something daft I says no James yeah. you know and you get folk wanting daft stuff yeah. and lad years ago I used to I used to tattoo him all the time he'd come in one day and he'd started smoking weed, and this was 18, 20 years ago, and he went, he says, I want to be Gonsley covering the top of my arm. I said, how long have you been smoking weed for? <laughs> and he says, oh, a couple of weeks. <laughs> You're not going to smoke weed the rest of your life, right. mate. I am, but I'm not doing it for you. But I want it done. I'm not doing it for you. And he went off in the oven. Yeah. A month later, he come in and thanked us. And he says, you're right, I've stopped smoking it, this is you, <laughs> fucking idiot. You know, and you're like, you know, that would have been it there, that would have been that you been there for forever, life, yeah. It? And there's only so much you can overcover with, isn't there? Oh, there is, I. Mean? Well, no, there isn't. You, now, I mean, I'm a mate of mine, Baz, I'm, he's got a full bodysuit, Baz, and he's is had his it, arms done this, three or four times. Is that I know, maybe? Lives oh, in, I don't know. Lives in town, it's absolutely covered. He lives, uh, he lives uh, Appleby. Yeah. Yeah. Hi. Yes, yeah. Yeah. Yes, uh, well, I'm covering right, his. If you're listening. <laughs> <laughs> I'm covering his arms. At the oh, yeah. Uh, but we're all we're using. He's had folk try to cover stuff in the past, but they always do the same thing. Right. Whereas I used to work on cover ups a lot just so I could learn them and yeah, I know yeah. what colours work with them. So it's all greens and blues right. and purples and that sort of thing. So you but... can have a really decent. Oh, uh, yeah. You uh, could cover that over. Yeah, uh, right. And with anything, I mean, that was Mickey did that freehand. I know it needs a lot of colouring, and you you can kind of well, see that. That'll have been his, good in its day. In its day, it was fantastic. Yeah. But he did that. I, I think I had some stupid Indian ink ones, home done ones under there. And I said, Can you just cover them over? He says, Yeah. And he spot on. But, but this was this would have been 88 ish. Yeah. So what's that? That's nearly. Oh God, nearly forty, 40 years ago. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah. And Aye, it, the colour's I mean, not bad. That's what I mean about Mickey. Mickey changed a lot. You know, there was a certain handful of artists at the time which were kind of changing the way it went, and then there was a guy down Essex. He was called Harry Potter, believe it or not. <laughs> Aye. And Harry was unbelievable. Was he? Aye, he had a photographic memory. Did he? Yeah, he could look at some and I knew it and just draw it on. Yeah. You know, never looking at the thing again, just draw it on and tattoo it. Wow. Uh, and I was going to get some work off him once, and a mate of mine went, don't get it. He says he hasn't got any tattoos himself. He absolutely hammers it in. Really? Uh, he had one little tattoo on there. Right. But this guy had tattooed in, I'm sure, the war, just the end of the war when he was in the Navy. Yeah. So he'd done it all his life, yeah, you know. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I mean, very, very clever bloke, and he won a lot of awards. Did him. he? Oh, uh, yeah, hell of a lot. Because is it, is it most tattooist won't, touch you know say for instance i think you won't I, touch another tattooist's work or not or is that just you get a lot of them saying they won't now i do yeah if i can redo it and i'll say look if you let us redo it i'll do it for you yeah and most of them will whereas most of them will go no no i don't do other people's shit and it's yeah. like you haven't got the experience to say that yeah, do you yeah. know what i mean yeah. you haven't got the years behind you yeah. to say that you grab what you can and make it better yeah yeah and that's where a lot of them falter me if i can make something better that puts me up there. Yeah. And yeah. other folks see because it's all word of mouth. Yes. So if somebody's got a bit Especially of shit on their arm. Especially in this day and age with social media. Oh, yeah. I mean, if somebody's got a bit of shit on their arm and you can make it look ten times better. Yeah. Their mates are going to see that. If yeah. you grab one person off their mates, that's a new customer yeah. you've got in. And then another one off them. And yeah. it's just a self-fulfilling. Oh, it is. And it works. But, I mean, that's what I mean with me. I don't fire any. At the odd time, I'll fire stuff on social media. And I find it better that way, and everything that comes in is organic. Yeah, yeah. You know, and that's a big phrase. Yeah, because I'd organic. imagine, yeah, <laughs> it is. You know, I'd, I never understood it for years. You know, the fuck's organic, organic. Mean, you know what I mean? <laughs> but it's true, because, like, the amount of tattoos 
that you must do in a week. And it, you'll probably put on one picture a fortnight, won't you? Maybe yeah. on your Instagram. Uh, sometimes less than that. Yeah. Sometimes months. So yeah. I'll put one on. If, if I feel it's dropping off a bit, I'll start to put a few. Like, I've got loads on my phone, but every time I get on, my kids are lively. So from the minute I get on, you're I'm your on. You're family man. Yeah. 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 And I Which forget about that. Yeah. yeah, it is. Yeah. And like at work, folk have this thing where... You, tattoo one's an easy life. Tattoo one's fucking hard work. I bet it is. And the minute you're in that shop, you're cleaning when you get in. Yeah. Then you're making designs up. Yeah. Your first customer will arrive. Uh, you'll have half an hour for your dinner, and yeah. then you're setting up for the next customer, and then that's you till five o'clock. Yeah. And that's you from half nine in the morning. Yeah. With, you know. Then you're cleaning down at the end. Yeah. And I mean, you'll have the odd fag. Yeah. I do have a fag, but you non-stop yeah. and folk think it's such an yeah. easy life yeah. like there's a lass lately she's been tattooing for I'd say a couple of years now and I used to see her husband at horse riding where I take my kids I used to see her now and again and I'd said to him a few times she's still seeing it through rose tinted glasses, glasses yeah. and like He'd said to us last time I seen him, she's, you know, yeah. sees it for what it is yeah. now. Because it's know. a job. Isn't oh, it, it is, eh? It's you know. a hard work yeah. job. Yeah. You've got to treat it as a hobby, and I say this to folk if you treat your job as a hobby, you'll never walk a day in yeah. your life. Yeah. But I mean, it sent me into depression and everything. So yeah. I say, well, like, it? Oh, God, ah, it? yeah, I've had a few bouts of that. Oh, yeah. What with uh, lack of work or what? Or? Drugs, work. Right. <laughs> you know. Just a. An accumulation uh, of... Yeah, drink. Uh, that's the problem with tattooing. You can hit the rock and roll lifestyle. Yeah, yeah. And, like, I drank for 20 years. Just on a night, I was never the alcoholic. Yeah. But I did, like, a drink. So yeah. every night, there was never a night I was sober for 20 years. Really? Oh, absolutely. Mind you, I've been a bit like that. And I think the best thing, if I was still like that, this wouldn't be existing now. Because yeah. I'd have just been passed out on the set. Every oh, night. that's it. Well, I mean, I did 20 years of weed. Did like, you? Like, solid. Yeah. Like, absolutely solid every night and I gave that up overnight did you I I just packed it up one night right that's me don't that's what I did I did that with smoking and I'd kind of done it with alcohol too. yeah and well I did it with the I think in I think in the space of six weeks I stopped smoking weed after 20 years I stopped drinking after 20 years and I stopped smoking which I'd done all my life I went back smoking eventually yeah. but I'm slowing down on that now but uh, a mate of mine he used to be into crack years ago and he got himself off that. But he says to me, he says, I fucking hate you. And I says, why? Well, he says, you can drop some overnight and just do it. He says, I fucking hate you. And uh, it was one of them that throughout that time, like, I think if you're intensive with a job and it takes over your life, there is a chance it's going to send you over yeah, the edge. Yeah. And, like, I've had major deep depression. And as well, I, I suppose, because you're... Your world, your lifestyle is, is like, like you said, it's that rock and roll yeah. kind of artistic, yeah. almost decadent yeah, kind of decadent, you know, right, but you know, I mean, lifestyle. And it would have been the social norm at those gatherings, like you were talking about, that one place where the guys used to just, just oh, uh, do that yeah. slow. So, you know, but that would have been... Oh, well, I mean, that was like Amsterdam, have, that. Yeah, and you will have been in that age... Yeah. And it was all impression, and we I think we're we're not just impressionable. No, well, that's at the any funny age, thing. I think we're... Like of all of the lads that came in the shop, and all of the folk that knocked about, I was the only stoner. Right. Like nobody else really did it. You know, that was my that was your thing. thing. Yeah, that, yeah. My, like I've never. I know it sounds like something daft and a cliche but i've never been right in the head <laughs> yeah you know my mother would tell you that yeah, do you know what i yeah. mean and well, i think i think i've always been an extrovert yeah and i've never kind of been on the same level as normality if you know what i mean I know so, exactly what you mean because I'm, I'm kind of the same yeah the job suited me and i yeah. found things out later on in life but the weed slowed us down right it dropped us and it said, come on, just chill out a bit, yeah, just yeah. relax, yeah. you know what I mean? And I kind of self-medicated with that for 20 yeah, years. Yeah. But it was only when I came out of it and I stopped doing it, it was like, oh, God, what could I get do without that? You know yeah. what I mean? And I started to do a lot more. Yeah. You know, and it was like, yeah, it's kind of better that. Yeah, you know? yeah. But it... still, you've got, I've got a lot of triggers in my head. Right. But I did, uh, I did an assessment. I was... Standing outside Mike's one day, I went a fag, just leaning on the fence. Yeah. 
I know loads of folk in Carlisle with doing the job I've done. An old mate of mine from the punk days come driving past in his taxi and just threw someone out the window at us and says, hey, you read that? And uh, when I was back in the day when I was in a band, we were back GBH. Did well, you? G, uh, GBH were the biggest punk yeah, band at yeah, the time. Yeah. Just, it was the first gig in the UK after returning from an American tour. Yeah. Now, this was back in the 80s. Yeah, this was yeah. about 85, yeah. 86. So that was a major thing. Uh, and we backed them. Well, it was a book about GBH. Right. And I thought, I wonder if I've got a mention in it, because I got on with them. You yeah. know, like, even when we came off stage, Collie, the lead singer, came right over to me, passed the rest of the band, <laughs> shoved a three skinner in me hand and went, you're a fucking wild crazy dude. <laughs> you know, like, what did you play then? I was the lead singer. Was you? Uh, uh, I got fired out of the band, I'll get to that. Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, <laughs> but we, uh, oh, what was I on about there? GBH seems in selling the you as a crazy dude. Oh, aye. What was I on about before that? Your mate chucking you the magazine through the taxi window. Oh, right, aye. So my head guns off on yeah, that. Yeah, I, I know. I'm surprised so, I remembered. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so it was a book about uh, the lead guitarist, GBH. Right. I can't remember his name. Uh, I think it was John. So I was reading it, and all the way through this book, I kept thinking, fucking hell, this bloke's like me. And all the way through it, fucking hell, he's not half like me, this bloke. And then he got to the end of the book and it said, so in the end I realised there was something wrong with us and I went for tests and got told I had Asperger and I was like, oh, for fuck's sake. Yeah. <laughs> so I thought, right, read bits of it again and it was like, yeah, so yeah. I got in touch with the doctors and they were like, we can send you for tests if you want. So I went, I went and got an assessment. Yeah. Well, during this assessment, they give you the IQ test, right. the government IQ test. So I'm doing this IQ test, and I wouldn't call myself the cleverest bloke. I'm good with my hands. Yeah. And part of it is cogn uh, cognitive thought. Right. And all the way through the cognitive thought bits, the woman that was doing the test kept going, bloody hell. <laughs> I was like, right. And then I do another bit, and she'd gone, God, yeah. <laughs> right. So then I eventually got my results, and it said we can't give you... Uh, an IQ score. Right. I was like, what do you mean? You can't give the fuck an IQ score. So I went back up to see these people. I said, why can't you give us an IQ score? Because you're basically on genius level with cognitive thought. Right. And it was like, right. So is that what my problem's been all my life? Well, probably. What about the Asperger's? We don't believe you've got Asperger's, but we think that you've had traits of it and you've got used to it all right. my life. Yeah, and then yeah. we got into other stuff. And it was like, well, to be honest, that sounds like you're borderline bipolar as well. And I was like, for fuck's sake, <laughs> is there anything else? So I've taught myself joinery. Yeah. I can make cabinets by hand, and I've never had a lesson off woodwork. Yeah. I've taught myself to do plaster and bits of plaster. Yeah. And, you know, I've taught myself to oil paint up to the standard of the masters. Yeah, I've seen your work. Yeah, it's incredible, believe me. I've taught myself to sculpt. I've taught yeah. myself to do all these things in life without yeah. ever watching a video on it. I yeah. just do it, just, look at stuff, and work it out. Yeah. And it was like, right, well, that's been my problem all my life. So I went and told my mother one day, I was having a coffee with my mother, and I said, seemingly, I'm a genius. <laughs> but he comes, and she, do you know what she said? She went, it's all right, son, they must be talking about somebody else. <laughs> <laughs> but I saw... But you not think, right, if you'd have been given that label oh, yeah. as a teenager, uh, it would have stuck with you through life, and you wouldn't be here now. But it's, it's funny... Not here. I, I, I look but... at the lads I went to school with, and I mean, now it's the big thing with the spectrum and yeah. all of this. They, 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 they happily give people labels they've now. They've got to. And it's kind of like, then these labels stick with people through their yeah. life. And I don't think that's necessarily a good thing. Oh, well, my little one, I'd say my little one's got a touch of ADHD. Yeah. Not massive, a touch, but from the minute she gets up, yeah. she's a coil spring. Yeah. And she goes off. And you've got to... And there was something I'd seen on TikTok the other week, and it says with ADHD, if you put their hand on the shoulder, yeah, it just levels them. Right. So one day she's bouncing about and doing 100 mile an hour, and I went, here, darling, I put my hand on the shoulder, and she just went home, and you know, and you think, oh, right, it was almost oh, like okay. you like a pause button. Right, and it was like, oh, right, right, let's think about this. And I'd said to the wife, and she says, yeah, that's what I do with her, that's why I give her a hug and that. Yeah. But you can calm her down, but she's got to be doing something yeah, yeah. but i look back at now at me with the way she is yeah and i think 
You're exactly like I was. I wonder how many kids when we was at school, oh, yeah. us included, well, that's would what have I was... been, yeah. you know, not you know, not sat out the headmaster's room oh, yeah. so often right. and getting the cane. Well, it if was it was, it, if they'd have sussed out what was the matter with us. What did they call it then? Was it the remedial class? Oh, I was in, yeah. Yeah, yeah. and it wasn't... It's I was in just, remedial maths. Yeah, well, it's just it like, the kids that were on the spectrum or yeah. kids that had touch ADHD. Yeah, yeah. But I think it's the American way. If you give it a label, yeah, they're quite happy. Yeah, like I was tattooing a kid one day, and I knew his father for years, and he kept saying about his son is just a little cunt. He's just a little cunt by the language, and I got him in for a tattoo, and he says he thinks I'm this, that, and the other. He says yeah. I've got ADHD, Chris. He says I can fix a car. He says I'm 17 year old, and my natural ability is cars. Yeah, nobody will give us a job. And he says, I stole my father's car. I've never not wired a car in my life. He says, but I knew how to do, do that. And you know, and you're like, you, you're doing it the wrong way. Yeah. Like, you know. He's kind of, he's, 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 he's gone off he's on the wrong channel. He's his, 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 his talents into the wrong direction. Yeah, isn't but it? he says, if somebody would give us a job, it's, it's I'd quite happily best. work yeah. for next to now. He says, yeah. I just love pottering about with cars. Yeah. But I know lads I went to school with, and they were, you could see they were on another level. And I've talked to a few folk from school since, uh, and they've said, oh, definitely, definitely on the spectrum, or yeah. definitely ADHD, yeah, yeah, you know. Yeah. And I think it's now, by giving them all a label, to give them an excuse. Yeah. You know, it's kind of like a good thing and a bad thing as yeah. well, because some people will just take that label... Oh, they will, And I? they'll just get as much as they... Uh, they'll abuse the label, oh, won't they? The band I was in... Uh, <laughs> the bass guitarist, Sid, who actually turned out was called Phil, funny enough, but he told us he was called Sid, Sid. for about five years. Uh, <laughs> How much to Sid Vicious? Yeah, he was on another level. <laughs> right. I mean, but he went for that, you know, he aimed for that. You could see he was aiming for it, you yeah, know. Yeah, yeah. And that's a different thing again. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. But getting back to the band, that was, the band was a good thing, uh, but that happened quite weirdly. Because, I mean, that band went for 30 years. What, your band? Aye, that, was, that went on for 30 years. They changed the name once. Yeah. And I don't know if they're still on the go now, but that was on the go for 30 years. Wow. Band. And how it happened, we were all on a night out one night, all punks at the yeah, time. Yeah. We were drinking in this boozer and mentioned about the band. Two of them played guitars. And I thought, well, I want to be in the band. And yeah. she says, I need a drummer. And I went, no, I can play drums, like. <laughs> Which I couldn't. Yeah. And this is can you? And I says, I saw, as random as it sounds, we managed to tap a drum set off someone. Yeah. So I couldn't play drums for the life of us. And this lad showed up. And he played the drums. So I thought, well, that's me. That's in the band. It, yeah. And my other mate, he was singing. So he was singing one day. Well, they started doing a Sex Crystals number. Well, my hero was Johnny Rotten yeah. at the time. I yeah, mean, yeah. you look at him now, he sells butter, you know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. But at the time, he was fantastic. Yeah. So I started, I, I could emulate him, so I started singing while the full band stopped, and I thought, right, I'll just leave it there. Yeah. And they went, no, 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 you sound exactly like it. So the other lad that was meant to be singer, he ended up being next to Newt, and I ended up the main singer. But they were good times. What was your image in the punk? Was you a... Because even in the punk genre, it was different. Well, there's two types of punks. You had your, I, I always, you had your militarised punks, which was the leather jacket, bondage side, yeah. big boots, Mohicans, that was me. Yeah, oh, you, were you in the Mohawk? Yeah, yeah. Uh, and then you had your proper type punks, which were the Johnny Rotten types, yeah. which just looked more like students. Yeah. But to me, they're kind of, we'd gone militarised and they're kind of understood punk more. Yeah. Because it's not was... just, I think punk is definitely an attitude rather than a, yeah, than a fashion, isn't it? Like you know, I know the two on... went hand in hand. Well, in the 70s, yeah, but by the mid 80s, it was underground movement, yeah. very, yeah. very underground. Yeah. And I mean, I can remember we played a gig in uh, Working of all places, and that was a funny gig because it was Sid that got us the gig. And it blagged him that we were. It was a group from Birmingham called Bazion, right. and they were a glam rock group. <laughs> and he blagged the manager of the place at work, and it was Carnegie Hall, yeah. in Rose Bar in Carnegie Hall. And he blagged him that we were a glam rock band. <laughs> and we sh we showed up, and there was these lots sat, and they looked like somewhere at the seventies. They were yeah. all big, long, curly hair spandex, yeah. you know. And it was like, oh. <laughs> 
And like the manager went, I thought you were fucking glam rock. <laughs> now we're punk rock. <laughs> right. And then one of these Fajon sparked up and says, oh, do you do the Sex Pistols? And I says, that's what we mainly do, Sex Pistols. Oh, I fucking love the Sex Pistols. <laughs> we had the place bouncing. <laughs> the Abs oh, absolutely bouncing. <laughs> but we did that. We did a one at Wickton. We did about three or four gigs. Yeah. And then we played GBH at Edinburgh, at the, ven at the venue at Edinburgh. That was really good. That was brilliant. That was the night of my life, that, because they were it. my heroes yeah, at the yeah, time. Yeah. Uh, and then we went for a night out one night and it all went tits up. So we went, there was a group in the late 80s called the Mega City Four. Yeah. And they were kind of on the fringes of punk uh, and a bit of rock. Yeah. You know, they were yeah. trying to create Church. their own vibe, but they were quite good. Yeah, yeah. So we all went for the night out. We thought we're going to see them, so we went in. So while we were in there, the lads I was in the band with decided that because we were a local band, we were just going to use their instruments and back them. <laughs> and they didn't tell me this. Yeah. So we says, well, go on through and meet the band. So we says, the bouncers, we're a local band, we've just come to say hello. And they went, I just got in. The bouncers kind of knew us. So they says, just got in. So we went in. So these lots stormed in and basically went, right, how are you doing? Mega City 4, we're the Exiles, we're a local band, we're going to back you, we're just going to use your stuff. And I was like, oh, what are you doing? <laughs> And they were like, that's what we're going to do in this mega city for. You could see them just looking at it. Who the fuck are these, look? <laughs> and I'm like, oh, well, you, you can't. We're not doing that at all. Yeah, we're yeah. here to see them. Yeah. And in the end, an argument busts out. And I says, right, fucking all he is outside. I'll fight this one by one. <laughs> Full of drinker. Thinking, I'm going to get a kick in here, but I'll make my point. <laughs> and they all, no, 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 no one troubles so them. Ended up outside. And the next day, I got a letter. A fucking letter. Explaining you're out the band. <laughs> no, and you're like, what the fuck? The fuck are you? But hey, I never spoke to them for years. You know, no, no, real. it was a proper fallout, was like, I, which was awkward because at the time, my other mate that was the other singer. So, yeah, punk, it's kind of like, I th were you always a punk or did you flirt with other kind no, of well, youth uh, culture? I know, you get a folk that say, and it's quite generic. I seen it at an early age. I can remember seeing the Sex Pistols on. Top of the Pops, and it must have been 77. Yeah. And I was hooked. Yeah. And by the age of 10, I was full on punk. Yeah. And we lived. So you never died, you never deviated at all. You I punk. did, and there was a thing with it, and it sounds quite daft, but you're young, and I'd have been about 10 year old, and it was the time when the UK subs were at number one with Stranglehold. Yeah. And I can remember standing outside with a mate of mine, we were both punks, and we couldn't get in the gig because we were too, too young. young. And we were listening to the UK subs, they were at number one in the charts at the time. And I went home that night, and I had PVC leather jacket on, which I'd got off my sister, which was too big for his. <laughs> pair of old jeans, pair of boots, punk t-shirt, which I'd drawn myself. Yeah. And my father, my proper father, uh, he was a bully. Was he? Aye, and he took all my gear off us and burnt it. Did he? Aye, and uh, a lot of the records went. And I had, <gasps> yeah, and it was one Such of them. Rich. It was just, he was a bully. Uh, and by the time I got, we ended up at Carlisle at 13. He died when I was about, I think, 12 or 13. Yeah. Uh, it sounds horrible, but that was the best thing that ever happened to my family. Do you yeah, know what I mean? Yeah. That does sound horrible, but yeah, he was a nasty man. Yeah. So we ended up back in Carlisle. And I was always obsessed with the punk, and I was still buying it. Yeah. And when we got back to Carlisle, I was I always lived my life on my level, yeah. the way I wanted, even when I was young. And I always have done all my life. You know, it's my rules, my life. Yeah. And my mother had sat us down when we got to Carlisle and said, right, look, you need to calm down. Dad's not here now. I need you to calm down. And it was like, right, fair enough. But when I get to 16 and I leave school, yeah. I go back to my rules. And she was fair enough. But I need you to behave until you're 16. Yeah. And I always remember we were uptown when I was about 16. And I was close to leaving school. And she'd seen a coat she liked. And she took us into Burton's and went, it's a lovely coat, do you want it? And I went, I told you, when I'm leaving school, I'm going back to being a punk. Yeah. And when I hit 16, that was it, me. I went straight back to being a punk. Right. The hair, the lot. The lot. You know, and it was, that was it. That's all I waited yeah, for. Yeah. 
and I lived the punk style. I, abs I loved it. But the thing was, and what a lot of folk don't realise is, Carlisle done such a lot for the punk movement. And still to this day, there's folk that were into the punk movement. Yeah. And I mean, one of them was one of the old managers of Carlisle United. Right. Uh, in the 2000s, I think about 2008 or something, 2010. And he was doing an interview and he said, I always wanted to come to Carlisle. He says, because Carlisle done everything for the punk Punks, movement yeah. in the 80s. Well, there was a club in Carlisle called the Stars and Stripes. And it had. And the good thing about the punk was, every time you went into the record shop and bought a new album, you knew that group would be in your town within a month. Right. So, whereas like you were into the rock music, yeah, yeah. you had to pay big money and it's very hard to see the rock bands because they're all worldwide yeah, stars. Yeah, yeah. The punk bands were underground, yeah. so when you bought that album, you knew you were going to see your idols. Yeah, yeah. I've sat and drank with GBH, The Exploited, Charlie Harper, the lead singer of the UK subs. So, he bought us a pint at the bar in the Stars it's and It's a totally different... It's they it? love their fans, yeah, they yeah. love them, yeah. and they still to this day get on with them. And the thing is, they'll have come off stage and just come into the crowd with you lot, wouldn't they? Yeah. Whereas, even though I was there at the beginning of like the thrash movement, so I was there at the beginning of like Slayer, Anthrax, Metallica, and we saw them when they were still only playing like 2000 yeah. venues, so it was still you know, you could still get on stage and stage dive off with them, but it was they wouldn't have. They didn't come into the crowd afterwards. Well, it's funny because, like, I'd say the, the big precursor for Thrash yeah. was GBH. And Metallica recorded their first album, or one of the first albums, in Birmingham at the studio where with GBH, GBH. And GBH used to tour America with Metallica and back them back. when they were starting. Right. And I think they still do at times. Do they? Aye. So they're becoming very, very much a, friends. Especially to the uninitiated <clears throat> ear. Yeah. They're very, it's very similar. Oh, it's, well, I mean, you had, you had bands, like there was a band uh, called Conflict. Yes. In, now, Conflict... Everybody knew Conflict, and I had a lot of albums by Conflict, but nobody knew who they were. Uh, yeah. Nobody knew them. I can remember going to see them, and there was a group came out and played at the start, and everybody in the crowd, bar about 5% that knew who they were, went, was that Conflict then? And then Conflict came, came out. On. Right. But they were all... The lead singer was... He had a he had an eye missing, he had an eye patch on, right. and they were banging to... Uh, hunt saboteur and stuff right. like that, and he yeah. lost his eye during a fight with a hunt sabot with doing with a hunt, hunt saboteur thing. Right. Yeah, yeah. And uh, punk kind of had that movement. It was a very, very, very aggressive thing to be in amongst. Yeah, it was. And you get these things now where they show you the, the, the slam dancing in yeah, the what's the yeah. mosh pit? Mosh pit. Yeah. Now the full dance floor was a mosh pit yeah. with uh, punk, and <laughs> I mean was. the dance was aggression. It was. And it was sheer aggression. It was. But that as was... much as you had a lot of trouble, you could go to any other town. It was the only movement I've ever known where you could go to any other town, and you bunk into another set of punks, and you'd spend the day with them. Yeah. Because you yeah. looked the same, because you were such a... You look different, yeah. you were different, yeah, you yeah, know, yeah. and it just had that whole... We everyone went, had, sorry. Everyone had that same sort of... Like I said earlier, it's not just the fashion, it was the mentality. Yeah, as well, it was. Wasn't it? Uh, it was the anarchist thing. Yeah. And you kind yeah. of lived up to that. And, I mean, as much as we shouted we were anarchists, we weren't, because we all work for a living. Yeah, yeah. You had the ones that were on the door and yeah, that and yeah, played that, yeah. but... Most of them work for a living, you know. What yeah. I mean, but they've all had like a second thing now. Most of the bands now are still going, yeah, yeah. and they're all making big money. money but it, you it? look at like some exploited and stuff like that. A lot of their music's being used on the skateboarding games and that. <laughs> they're learning a hell of a lot of money off royalties. It's, like, it's funny know? how songs that were maybe in tunes that were back, sort of almost rebellious back in the day, yeah. are being used for car adverts. Yeah, they are, you know? right. <laughs> like it's funny. Uh, many a time I'll say to the wife, "That's so and so, yeah. that's so and so," and it's like, but I don't know. It's I think mental. I think with the punk, I like. I always loved. There was a camaraderie. I loved the way that it, you dress. Yeah, you know. That's what I was talking about with another guest I had recently, Tony. And he's a big metaler as well. And it's like he says, when he used to go to Donington, which was like the Monsters of Rock Festival, and he says, you'd get people from literally all, you know, all over the country, all oh, over the right. world, but everybody yeah. was there. It was that camaraderie. I said, and like I said to him, I've, all the gigs and rock concerts I've been to over the years, I've never seen any trouble. No. Because we're all there. 
yeah. you know, for the same reason. Well, I can remember in the 80s going to see the Ramones. Yeah. Now, the Ramones, now, the rock royalty. Yeah, yeah. And I can remember having a kid in the shop a while ago and he had a Ramones T-shirt on and I went, I went to see them in the 80s and he said, I don't know who you're on about. And I says, the Ramones, they're on your T-shirt. And he went, Are they, were they a band like? And I thought, fuck <laughs> sake. <laughs> but I mean, I didn't even like the Ramones. Yeah. But it was like all my mates were into them. Yeah. Were going, and yeah. it was like, it's probably the only chance you'll you ever get, get to, to see, see them. And what it, it was weird because every song started with go and lasted a minute. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? <laughs> and it, that was it. And that's all they got. But the gig was, there was like, the thing with the punk, some stuff was disgusting. They'd spit at the group if they right. appreciated them. <laughs> yeah. And I can remember there was a bunch from working the White Heaven, the working the White Heaven skins. Yeah. They were a big bunch of lads. They were all rough, tough lads. Were they? I got on with a lot of them. All the rest of my mates were terrified of yeah. them. I got on with them. They were good, good lads. lads. They were genuine, but they were dodgy. Yeah. You, you know, there if was a group like down you, Birmingham called the Trojan. Uh, yeah, they're one. still on the go. Are they still so, on the yeah, Pretty much a scooter thing yeah, now, yeah, aren't they? Yeah. Right? But uh, if, you, if you ever saw the, the, that spray the Trojan, uh, you knew they'd been through town. <laughs> oh, I, they're still on the go, then. They're big scoop clubs, I'm not like. They were back then, weren't they? But uh, these lot, they were proper dodgy, but they were at the front of the Ramones gig, and the lead singer, he was sick of getting spat at, and he basically said over the mic, any more spitting were going off. And it was these skinheads that were doing it. <laughs> and this big burly biker guy had come out, who was part of their security. The road team, whatever, yeah. And you could see, and the stage was about, if you were standing up, the stage was there. Yeah. You know, so you were looking up at yeah. it. And he's pointing like this, and this big skinhead jumped up over the knee where and grabbed him by the air and Just dragged him in the crowd. Well, the lead singer, I think it was Jordan Warren, he had tears running down his face. He was <laughs> howling with laughter. <laughs> and this guy got kicked from the front of the stage all the way to the back of the crowd. And it was like, you could see Jory Bourne just went like that, as if to say, absolutely spot on, you know. But that was the thing with the punk game. But it was totally, you know, it was, like you said, there was an aggression there, and it was the same with, with thrash metal. I yeah. think that's what, well, I'm not a violent person, but it was, you got that aggression and that- It got it out. Teenage angst out uh, here, didn't it? You know what I mean? Because. They're going about mosh pits nowadays, but... Ah, they're not what they were. Nah. I mean, you got slam dancing was a thing, and then there was... Um, well, like, the slam dancing came from the psychic league. Yeah, from the wrecking. Aye. Yeah, because yeah. I saw... I, I flirted with quite a few youth kind of tribal culture things, uh, so I was a bit of a psychobilly at one point. And we oh, went see, to, I always went to a lot of them gigs. They were, they were some fantastic. of the best gigs. The Meteors, we went to see the Meteors. They oh, well, awesome. kicked off in Carlisle, that. Did it? Yeah, they brought the Wrecking Crew with them. And, Did they? Uh, what it was, they, they brought about 20 of the Wrecking Crew with them. And oh, a mate of mine, is he was Ed Case. He's a brilliant lad, but he was Ed Case when he was younger. And uh, it was one of the lads that was with us. There was a, a slam dance gun on, and he kind of fell out of it, and there was a big... This guy was big black guy that was yeah. with the wrecking crew, and he just backhanded this lad and knocked him clean out. Right. And three of the lads carried him and put him on our table, yeah. and he was spark out. out. Yeah. Uh, so we put him in the recovery position. Well, that was a rather abrupt end, wasn't it? Well, that's because we ran out of space on the SD card. Can you believe it? What a schoolboy error. Anyway, I've bought a bigger one, so that shouldn't happen again, except the previous, the next episodes that I do do, the camera overheated because it was too much space. But, you know, it's a learning curve, what can I say? Anyway, if you want to find out what happened to Chris's mate at the infamous Meteors gig in Carlisle, which I'm guessing would be around about 1984, uh, stay tuned for the next episode for part two. And just so you don't miss it, why not give Spud Life a subscribe? You know, whatever you're listening to this or watching this on, just hit that subscribe button for me, please. No, I'm not picking. So, you know what though, if you do, it's massively appreciated and it just spurs me on to make even more content. If you if you liked it, tell your friends, get them to watch it, listen to it. I, I really enjoy what I do so far, so I hope that comes across. And... As always, thank you so much for listening and watching. And stay tuned via the subscription button that you've just pressed to find out what's happening in the Caravan of Love on the next upcoming episode of Spud Life. 
so from me your host Tatty Tim hope you have a wonderful week and it's peace and love for me and I'll see you then thanks a lot guys bye <laughs>